Warning, the following content may contain adult language, crimes against children, crimes of a sexual nature, or sometimes extreme details of their crimes we report on. Please use discretion when listening. Welcome back to another episode of Lies and Alibi. I'm Megan. And I'm Cam. Today's case has always been one of those ones that just dragged me into all of the rabbit holes. Everything seems curious, but at the same time, nothing quite fits just right to make sense. Now, this is the case of Mara Murray, a college student who vanished after her car crashed into a snow pile. The disappearance of Mara Murray is perhaps the most highly speculated case of the 21st century. It's been called the first crime mystery of the social media age, due to Facebook's launch five days before she went missing. Mara was born May 4, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts. After graduating high school, she joined her older sister at the United States Military Academy in West Point, New York, where she studied chemical engineering. During her freshman year, Mara received an honor code violation for stealing makeup from a Fort Knox commissary. She wasn't formally expelled, but following the incident, she did transfer schools. Mara ended up attending the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She was studying to become a nurse there. Things were going well until November 2003, about three months prior to her disappearance. Mara was actually caught ordering food with a stolen credit card. And her arrest record shows that, you know, if she was good for three months, that the charge would be dismissed. So keep this in mind because it could be important later on. Okay, will do. Did anything else happen closer to her disappearance? Because, I mean, while it's important to note, this past run-in with the law was just three months before she went missing. Yeah, I see what you mean. It's some background information for sure, but still important. However, to answer your question, yeah, some weird stuff was going down in the days before she vanished. On February 5th, 2004, Mara was working an evening shift at her campus security job. Following a phone conversation with her older sister, Kathleen, she was said to have burst into tears and a supervisor had to escort her back to her dorm. When she was asked what was wrong, Mara simply responded, my sister. Kathleen claims that the conversation was about her alcohol abuse. Kathleen had recently been discharged from rehab, and she had admitted to Mara that night on the phone that her fiancé had taken her to a liquor store. I can see being upset, but in my opinion, this was almost too upset. Yeah, I mean, I'm overly emotional sometimes, and I don't even see myself bursting into tears over this situation. Being angry? Yeah, I can see myself getting pretty ticked off and just, you know, frustrated with my sister, but I can't see myself, like, having a emotional breakdown because of this. Yeah, I can see what you're saying, but you don't have a sister. I, uh... <laughs> Really, I mean, we wouldn't know her situation till we're in her shoes. I think it might have been too upset, but maybe it really bothered her. Very true. I mean, you never know how you're going to handle it until you're in it. So, we can speculate all day long, but that's as close as we can come. The next curious event comes a few days later. On Saturday, February 7th, Mara's dad, Fred, arrived in town to take her car shopping. After car shopping, Fred and Mara went back to the Quality Inn where Fred was staying, and then they went to dinner at the Amherst Brewing Company. About 9 o'clock that night, Mara and Fred went and picked up Mara's friend, Kate. Then, Mara, Kate, and Fred all went back to the Amherst Brewing Company for drinks. Before Mara and Kate dropped Fred off at the Quality Inn for the night, they went to a liquor store. Mara also borrowed Fred's brand new car and attended a party on campus. At 3.30 a.m., she was driving back to Fred's hotel room when she hit a guardrail and caused $10,000 worth of damage to the car. Cops arrived at the scene and drove Mara to the hotel back to her father, but there was no documentation of a sobriety test in the accident report at all. 
Now, I couldn't tell you how I would feel if we went and just bought a brand new car and loaned it to one of our kids and they wrecked it. I would definitely be frustrated to say the least, but that's what insurance is for. I mean, accidents happen whether it was truly an accident or if there was a third party substance in their body that caused it. I would be frustrated, but I couldn't see myself going ballistically mad. Like, I, I couldn't do that. All of this with her dad, her friend, and the wreck was on February 7th, continuing into the early hours of February 8th. The last day we have record of Mara alive is February 9th. So my timeline starts around February 8th at midnight. Okay, let's hear it. On February 9th, 2004, just after midnight, Mara searches MapQuest for directions to the Berkshires and Burlington, Vermont. The next record we have of Mara comes later on that same day, February 9th at 1 p.m. Mara emails her boyfriend to say that she hasn't felt like talking to anyone lately. Mara also says that that's why she hasn't answered any of her boyfriend Bill's phone calls, but she promised Bill she'll call him later. Between 1 and 1.13 p.m., she made a phone call inquiring about a condo rental in Bartlett, New Hampshire. She was familiar with the condos as her family had vacationed there in the past. The phone call lasted three minutes and no rental plans were made. Mara then called a fellow nursing student. 1.24 p.m., Mara emails a nursing school supervisor to say that she would be out of town for a week due to a death in the family. However, her family insists that there was no death. 2.05 p.m., Mara calls a number that provides pre-recorded information about booking hotels in Stowe, Vermont. The phone call lasted five minutes. 2.18 p.m. Mara left her boyfriend a voicemail. The call lasted one minute, and she said they would talk later. Mara then packed her car with clothes, birth control pills, textbooks, and toiletries. Mara also took her favorite book with her, a book titled Not Without Peril. This is interesting because it's a book about mountain climbing in the White Mountains, which was the direction she was heading. Later searches of her dorm room found that most of Mara's belongings were packed in boxes and her art was removed from the walls. Police found a printed email in the room between Mara and her boyfriend that indicated a relationship problem. At 3.30 p.m., Mara drove away from the campus in that same old, unreliable 1996 Saturn and never came back. At 3.30, Mara appears next on the ATM camera where she withdrew $280. She also picked up $40 worth of alcohol from a nearby liquor store. Security footage at both the ATM and the liquor store determined that she was alone at the time. The next time we have record of Mara is between 4 and 5 p.m. Her last recorded phone call was at 4.37 to check her voicemail. Then at 7.27 p.m., Faith Westman of Woodsville, New Hampshire, called 911 to report an accident outside her home. She heard a loud thump and saw a car along the snowbank on Route 112. The car was pointing west in the eastbound lane, and Faith's neighbors, Virginia and John Marote, also noticed the car out their kitchen window. They said the hazard lights were on and that they noticed someone walking around the outside of the car almost like circling it to check for the damage. As the Marotes were watching, another neighbor, Butch Atwood, pulled up to Mara in the school bus that he drove for work. Atwood got out of his bus and asked if Mara needed him to call the police. Mara said no and claimed that she had already called AAA. Knowing that the area didn't have cell service, Butch doubted her story. He offered to let her wait at his home until assistance arrived, but Mara insisted she was fine staying at her car. Atwood returned home and still called 911. He said he initially had trouble getting through to dispatch because of busy phone circuits, but his phone call eventually connected at 7.43 p.m. Police arrived on scene by 7.45 p.m. The responding officer wrote that evidence at the scene indicated the vehicle had been eastbound and had gone off the roadway struck some trees, spun around, and come to a rest facing the wrong way in the eastbound lane. The destruction was evident to the driver's side, front end, front passenger's side, 
rear driver's side and rear passenger side. So basically the whole car. The windshield had also been damaged. The vehicle was locked and Mara was not present at the site. An eyewitness to the event was Butch Atwood, the bus driver. And he told police that the car was driven by a young girl who requested that he not inform the police about the accident, even though he did anyway. Law enforcement quickly doubted that alcohol had been a contributing factor to the accident, even though a carton of Franzia wine was evident on the passenger seat and there was a red liquid on the driver's side door and the roof of the car. Something else that's been noted and highly speculated about was that there was a rag stuffed in Mara's tailpipe. Some have said that when Mara got out and was walking around her car, she herself placed the rag in the pipe as a coded message to her father. Others think that the rag was intentionally put there to make Mara have to stop, as in like something would go wrong with her car and they could abduct her kind of thing. However, before I let my car crazy husband take this and run with it, I will add that Fred Murray has claimed he told Mara to stuff a rag in the tailpipe to reduce, hide, or prevent smoke from her car's tailpipe. Okay, so here is the car crazy side of me. I don't believe that you can stuff a rag in a tailpipe and it would shut the car down. What that whole thought is, um, you're playing a prank on your buddies, and I've done this. So you stuff a potato in a tailpipe. What that'll do is that will cause so much back pressure in the engine you won't be able to continue driving that car. It'll just shut it down. Um, So I would believe putting a rag in your tailpipe would do more for reducing smoke if you're burning oil or antifreeze and and trying to hide the smoke or if oil is splashing out the backside of the tailpipe. But to keep the car from running, I really don't think that would happen. All right, well... You still didn't answer one of the questions. So you don't think it was an abduction tactic. And you do think it could be used to, you know, prevent smoke and oil and whatnot. But what if it was a coded message to her father? What if, what if, now bear with me, what if she ran away and said, Dad, I got to go. Things are happening, but I got to go. And he said, all right, well, I need to know that you're okay. Maybe she had a plan to ditch the car and run away. And maybe he said, if you're successful, put that in there and let me know. I see that red rag and I know, okay, things went as planned. Or on the flip side, I see that red rag and I know something's wrong. Mara's in danger. Really? I mean, that's almost ingenious. If that is the case, then we need to set something up like that. Like, if something happens, I don't know, flip your (laughs) blinker a different way. I don't know. Like, turn your brights on and turn your blinker to the left. If that is truly the case, that is ingenious. And really, we should do something like that. If that could be a coded message, maybe she had two rags in her car. She had a white rag and a red rag. And a red rag meant she was in trouble. And on the flip side of that, red rag could have meant you know what, Dad, I'm, I'm okay, I'm getting out, I will find you when it's time. I almost lean more towards that because her dad has been like hell-bent and determined that something happened to his daughter. To my knowledge, he has always been more set on the abduction theory. I don't know if, like you said, that red rag is like, hey, something's wrong, and that's kind of where it led him to believe or what, but We could get lost in this rabbit hole all day, so I'm going to hop off the soapbox. After all of this, the car was finally pulled away, but not before the responding officer collected a Coke bottle that contained a red liquid with a strong alcoholic odor in it. An APB was issued for Mara after 12 p.m. on February 10th, and she was first considered missing at 5.17 p.m. The following day, police dogs tracked her scent 100 yards east of where her vehicle had been abandoned before losing the trail. The FBI was called in 10 days after her disappearance, and it became a nationwide search. The New Hampshire Fish and Game was also brought in 10 days later to conduct ground and air searches using a helicopter equipped with thermal imaging cameras. 
Although her family disputes these claims, police repeatedly expressed concern that Mara was suicidal. Many criticized the police for their lack of urgency during the initial days. Almost a full day had passed by the time Mara was announced missing. And even then, a search wasn't immediately commenced. Unfortunately, she was considered an adult. Now, as parents, we're going to worry. If, if something happens, we're going to worry. We want them to be safe. We want them to be taken care of. We want them to be protected. On the legal side of it, they're not going to immediately start looking without probable cause of an abduction or a possible murder or anything like that just for that simple fact, and it sucks. There are plenty of stories out there where adults, full-grown men and women, have disappeared from the face of the earth, and your gut instinct as a parent or as a friend, as a, a sibling, is something is wrong, but they won't do anything about it. Honestly, I think that's something that needs to change, but we really don't have the manpower, and it sucks. With all that being said, you know, was there any more theories about what could have happened to her? There are several. Most people assume she was picked up by an opportunistic murderer, but that assumption is based only on the truth that the search dog lost her smell in the center of the road. But when it comes to dogs, you have to think, you're in New Hampshire, you're in the winter, it's snowing everywhere, snow's water, water covers a person's tracks, and it covers their scent. Could that have thrown the dog off? Because being from the South, I don't know much about snow, but I know a lot about water. When we learn history, especially in the state we live in, when we learn our state's history in eighth grade, they teach us a lot about the Civil War. They teach us a lot about the Underground Railroad. And with that, they teach us about the runaway slaves and the fact that they would often have, you know, their masters and the master's dogs running after them to throw the dogs off the trail. Now, these weren't trained dogs, mind you, but to throw the dogs off the trail, what they would do is jump into the nearest creek, river, pond, and go through it. And that way, they come out the other side, they somehow change their tracking abilities. Maybe the dogs were able to lose the scent just because they went in the water and they swam upriver a little ways and got up on the other side. Now, snow, I don't know if that would do the same thing. Cadaver dogs are trained to smell bodies more than six feet underground. Now, snow is a good insulator, but I don't know if it's a better insulator than dirt. That'd be something I, I have to research and, and figure out because I'm getting kind of curious now that we're talking about it. So maybe I'll, I'll find something a little bit later on. But snow is water, but I don't believe it would insulate the smell or, or hide that smell, dissipate the smell, whatever term you want to use. I don't think that would be a good enough thing for the, the dogs to lose the scent. Another theory is that Mara's intention was to disappear that day. She was planning to meet up with someone, and that individual picked her up after the crash. James Renner, an investigative journalist and crime novel author, claims he largely believes that Mara is still alive and planned her own escape, possibly because she was pregnant. Mara had searched online for the effects of alcohol on a fetus. However, some of her nursing school friends have later said that, you know, this was just research for an assignment. Maybe they're covering for her. Maybe it's the truth. I don't know. Renner reported that a friend of Mara's emailed him and accused Bill, Mara's boyfriend, of being an abusive boyfriend. Just last year, Bill Roth, Mara's old boyfriend, was indicted by a grand jury on felony sex abuse. There was also rumors swirling around that Mara had been in a relationship with Hussein Baghdadi. Baghdadi was an assistant track coach at UMass where Mara attended school. And he has openly spoken about the situation and told detectives that Mara previously hinted to him that she might disappear. The UMass Outing Club owns a cabin in the White Mountains, and some believe that is where she was headed. There's no reports indicating that Mara and Baghdadi were in communication in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. Shoot, honestly, I mean, if you were looking to get out of a bad relationship, 
this would be the way to go. Even now, nobody knows where she is. That is one hell of an escape route. If you think that getting out is a good idea, that, that's great. Just let your family know. Tell somebody where you're at. Somebody that you can trust that they're not going to tell that abusive ex-partner, ex-boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, fiance, whatever it is. My thoughts on this is that the only reason I can see her not telling a soul is because she cared about her loved ones and her friends so much that she might have feared for them if she did, if that's the case. But yeah, no, otherwise I agree. I would uh, want somebody to tell at least one person so we know you're okay, but then we also wouldn't be here right now. This is a case that does not have a shortage of theory. The prevailing theory is that Mara was abducted, again, by either an opportunistic predator or a serial killer. Fred Murray believes someone locally who knows the area, knows where to go, knows how to get into some places and out of some places without being seen, somebody who would fit this bill he thinks abducted his daughter. In an interview with WCVB, Fred admitted he still visits the site of his daughter's crash. Mara has even been tossed in the hat as a possible victim of serial killer Israel Keys. The theory here is that Mara, when she had her car crash in 04, she met with foul play at the hands of Keys, either because, A, he was in the area and happened to cross her as a victim of opportunity, or, when this one has been suggested some, that Keys might have stopped her beforehand and made her disappearance look like the result of a car accident since he bragged during police interviews that some of his alleged murders were ruled accidents by law enforcement. Honestly, though, I don't personally buy into this theory. What do you think, Cam? So Israel Keys is a pretty interesting case. It would be something to say that he was the one that killed her, but we've actually done a ton of research, more so Megan than me, on the whereabouts of Israel Keys and his timeline of where he was at when all these murders occurred. And currently he was over 24 uh, currently he was over 2400 miles away from where Mara disappeared from. To me, I think that rules him out. I think it would be more so either disappearance, like she wanted to up and leave for some reason, whether it was abuse or she was disappointed in herself and wanted to go where nobody knew her, or that she did get abducted. And, you know, that whole long, drawn-out explanation, I don't think Israel Keys was a part of it in the slightest. Yeah, as much as people want to connect him to things, I just don't think it can be done here. There is a website I found during my research called Mamma Mia. And this website reports that some people believe Mara may have arranged her own disappearance because she was pregnant. Author James Renner, who wrote a book about Mara's case, suspects she may have used an underground system to leave the country and is likely living in Canada. Although she didn't really have any money with her to speak of, some people have suggested that she could have used the $4,000 from her father. Despite the fact that it is an intriguing theory, Mara didn't make any phone calls following her accident, nor did she attempt to contact any of her friends and family in the 17 years since she went missing. Mama Mia also reports that there have never been any credible sightings of Mara in Canada or anywhere else for that matter. Some theories suggest she could have wandered into the woods and simply died of exposure, or that she walked into the woods and ended her own life. However, WCVB reports authorities never found any tracks or footprints leading into the woods from her car. Nevertheless, the woods near her crash site have been searched numerous times and no sign of Mara has ever been found. Now, before I bring up the next three things, I am going to say this. Keep an open mind. These three things to me are either one, a clever ruse by someone, maybe more than one someone, and, you know, they're pretending to be Mara because they're just, like, sick people. Or, you know, two, 
It really is her. She is alive, well, and vanished on her own free will. Okay, I am ready to hear this one. <laughs> well, good, because I actually want you to start by reading this letter from the Mara Murray is not a missing person webpage. The page consists of literally just this letter, and it will lead us into another theory. Okay, so this letter reads, Mara Murray has the right, as every independent adult does, to leave with her new boyfriend and start a new life. Mara is living a content and satisfying life in the Providence of Quebec. Mara's father, Fred Murray, never quite forgave her for being asked to leave West Point. It was his personal bragging point that he had two daughters at West Point. Mara's dismissal damaged Fred's ego, and he never completely forgave her. Mara being asked to leave West Point and all ensuing criticism by her father was the beginning of a certain line of thought for Mara, culminating in her leaving on February 9, 2004 to start a new life unencumbered by the constant criticism of her father. Mara's relationship with William Roche was near its end. According to Mara's sister, Kathleen, they were having serious problems. Mara had met someone new, who unlike William, had no West Point connections and therefore was not a constant reminder to her of her failure at West Point. On the night of February 5th, 2004, Mara took a break from her job at the security desk at UMass to go and briefly get a cup of coffee and some food. Sometime between 12 midnight and 1 a.m., Mara driving her Saturn struck and critically injured a UMass student, Patrick Bassey, leaving him for dead. Around 1 a.m. to 1.20 a.m., February 6th, Mara had a complete emotional breakdown brought on by this hit-and-run accident. Mara's breakdown was witnessed by a student who reported this to Mara's supervisor, who then came and saw that Mara needed physical help to get back to her dorm. The supervisor then physically helped Mara back to her dorm and recommended counseling. Between 2 and 3 a.m. on the morning of Sunday, February 8th, Mara had a second motor vehicle accident wrecking her father's brand new car. Fred Murray's new car was towed around 3 a.m. to his Hadley motel room. Mara arrived at Fred's motel at the same time as the passenger in the tow truck. Fred was not happy with Mara to put it mildly. What happened in this motel room we'll never really know, but I do know for a fact that there was some physical violence on the part of Fred Murray. Fred has a history of domestic violence and the next day, Mara left for good. Mara needed to disguise the evidence of Patrice Bassey, hit and run by staging another accident for the purpose of covering up the damage to her car. She and her new boyfriend traveled in tandem to Route 112 in New Hampshire. The accident was staged. She left her Saturn, walked down the road to where her boyfriend was waiting for her in his car. She disappeared. Her only wish is that she be left alone to live her life in peace. She is happy and content and just wants to be left alone. Before you say anything, who the heck is Patrick Bassey and what is this all about? From the very beginning, there was a rumor that the reason Mara Murray had to do something about her car so quickly and a motive for running was because she hit Patrick Bassey with her car and fled the scene. The night she had the mental breakdown on campus was four days before she vanished. You mean the breakdown where she had to be walked back to her dorm room, correct? Exactly. Bassey doesn't remember anything about the accident or the moment before it happened. He thinks it's probably not connected to Mara, and because of this, police never overly looked into it as being a likely theory. Sharon Roche and others made a point not to mention that Mara was on the phone with Billy at the time of the Bassey hit and run. Allegedly, you know, if this incident proved to be in fact Mara. It is said that Bill told her to keep driving and hung up as to not be considered an accomplice. So if Bassey truly has no recollection of the accident, how can police honestly rule her out? I agree 100%. It doesn't overly make sense. Like most things in this case, it, it really is a rabbit hole. To make things more curious, in 2016, the Amherst PD had to be ordered to release the investigation order findings. Though I do not know what those were, like most other theories, this is one that could go either way. All right, this is the last one, and I'm not sure what to make of it. 
this is an email exchange between someone claiming to be Mara and then James Renner himself, who authored a book on his investigation into Mara's case. Cam and I will be reading this as if he is reading the emails of James and I for Mara's, or whoever is pretending to be Mara's. One Sunday around 4.43 p.m., James Renner received the following message from an email account fsm.sb at protonmail.com. The message read, Dear James, I've written to you a few times. You've never responded. I've told you I found Mara some years ago, no longer her name. After making sure it was her, we talked for a while. I've never bothered her again since in person. I have sent a few emails through our Proton account. Her biggest wish is to be left alone. She made mistakes, some serious, and ran. She speaks fluent French. She still drinks cherry coke through a red licorice straw. Then there is a paragraph concerning a specific motive for her running away, and that's actually been removed in the transcription. And the letter goes on to say, Let sleeping dogs lie, James. You won't find her. It took me five years of searching to track her down looking in the places you ignored. M. At first, James thought this was the work of a troll, as that's something not uncommon to this case, but still he replied back. If this is real, give me some piece I can verify. A photo or something. Otherwise, I have to assume this is a troll. The nightmare vanished. There was a very short call. This was a mistake. The person calling was supposed to call the other number. He came up from Boston using 93, called from near Concord. The reason people don't get which way she went is they presume she went towards the bus driver's house. The car that picked her up was coming from the other direction on 112. They went back the way Mara came, then headed off onto the main highway 91 via 302 North. Everyone presumes she went in the direction her car was pointing. She didn't. She ran a very short way towards the bus driver's house because the red SUV stopped short of her car. That's it. I'm kind of pleased you think this is a troll. I also believe that if something doesn't fit into your way of thinking, you discount it. You are your own worst enemy, M. You still haven't given me anything that can't be found in papers online. Give me something that is not known. The next message is just summarized to say that the message contained a narrative about how Mara disappeared and who helped her. The story that developed began with the claim that Mara had been driving her car during a break from work Thursday night and hit Patrick Vassy, which brings us back to that idea, while on the phone with someone who, if you believe what we read before, happened to be Bill. That person told her to keep driving. When they learned Vassie was in a coma, a conspiracy began to take the car to New Hampshire, stage a small accident so that the car could be fixed up there away from UMass police looking for a vehicle with front end damage. Still, there was nothing yet that could not be found online, so James kept pushing. What did Sharon Ross mean when she said Joseph was comforted by Harry on the other side of Shredded Navy? This is a reference to a strange riddle that Sharon Roth once put in an article when asked what she'd say to Mara if she were still alive. P.S. Thought that you would want to know Joseph is comforted with Harry on the opposite side of Shredded Navy. I know you get it, smiley face. Joseph, we later learned, was a stuffed monkey that Mara had received as a gift. M. replied back saying, Because they sleep in blue tissue paper, Side by side. Joseph in that text wasn't the pet. It was Bill. Harry was comforting Bill. That's all you're getting. But usually, Joseph and Harry slept side by side in blue tissue paper. It was shredded by the monkeys after being put in large pieces. I will say one more thing. Although the monkeys weren't real, they were. It was role play of them having babies together. Joseph was Bill's boy and Bill in a way Tamara and him. It's complicated. By this time, it became apparent to James that the person using the email account was trying to suggest that they were, in fact, Mara Murray herself. 
At this point, he began sharing emails with law enforcement in New Hampshire. I also wonder about that call to the child counselor in Weymouth. You must be confused. It was Marilyn the original call was made to. The rest, I don't want to talk about. You know why. What is in Marilyn? It doesn't matter. You've obviously only got some, if any, of the story. I have a question for you. Are you in love with Mara? Why won't you let her go? I feel a responsibility to cover the stories of other victims that came out of this one. The people Bill attacked, the people Wall threatened, the people Aaron victimized. If I knew Mara was alive and well, I'd take the website down. She wouldn't get in any trouble. And man, I'd love to hear her story. The victims that came out of this story, although they have my sympathy, the people involved would have found another avenue to perpetrate their wills and ways on. Let me get a lawyer to help you. I can't, Mr. Renner. I know I won't be charged for the Vassy thing, as the statute of limitations has passed, and I was never a suspect or charged. What can change my life is having to leave the country I now call home. In April 2024, I have to renew my ID. The system has changed somewhat, and I won't be able to fool it anymore. I'm panicking, to be honest. People want me found. People don't want me found. Some people want me found for their own fame. I just want to be left to enjoy the life I have. Please, Mr. Renner, stop looking. I really want to believe. Can you tell me where you stayed the night you disappeared? Newport, Vermont. I want to know what you think of me. Do you think I'm a sociopath? If this is Mara, I would say no. I think she's a survivor. I'm not a survivor. I did it with blind luck and meeting the right people at the right time. The start off money helped me a lot and bought my new name. The rest is just learning from mistakes and listening to conversations. Can you tell me how the Bassy thing went down? I went for a break or more time to speak with Bill. I was on the cell phone. I had been crying, then I wasn't paying attention. And next thing, he's there. He hit the front of the car, went over the hood, and kind of bounced on it. Then, as I hit the brakes, he fell to the ground to the right. It was terrifying. Bill screamed at me to carry on driving. I was in shock. It took a while for it to sink in. Bill ended the call because he didn't want to be involved. That's it. I sat shaking at work with my thoughts about what had happened. So I finally broke down and was taken back to my dorm by my supervisor. Would you consider meeting? Sorry, at this time, no. But if you'd asked me a year ago if I'd be talking to the man who believes I'm a sociopath, I'd have said no. So... The conversation eventually came to an end. After this person said that they were told by a friend to end it, the last message James shares says, All the money in the world couldn't change my life back to what it was inside the family I had. The good thing about being where I've been for so long is how forward-thinking people are and were. Bitcoin has been very kind to many of us. From the beginning, I lived close, not literally, to some of the biggest crypto mining organizations in the world. I have all I need. The only worry I have is 2024. I really need to go now, Mr. Renner. I hope I've helped clear your head a little and solve some of the mysteries that have bothered you for so long. Sorry, it couldn't have been more dramatic. The last one he shared? What do you mean by that? So, as he was unsure if it was really Mara or not, he kept a lot of the correspondences private. However, it's worth noting that James himself believes that this was a troll, most likely. But after finding that one web page you read earlier, it kind of makes me think. You know, that web page that is literally just a letter, the one I said was titled Mara Murray is not a missing person. And that page is actually going to be linked in the show notes. From the information we have here, I mean, it could possibly be a troll, but there was a lot of information going back and forth between the two. where It really makes me think that that probably was Mara. Just like everything else in the story, it could go either way. The final, most recent update in the case was when bone fragments were found out on Loom Mountain. 
Loon Mountain is less than 25 miles from where Mara left her car and disappeared. Authorities confirmed that the findings were in fact skull fragments. Now, diagnostic testing to identify the skeletal remains are pending. Mara's family anxiously awaits the news that the remains could be hers, but it could take several months for the results to come back. So, most everyone who hears what we know regarding this case has a theory of their own. What is yours? Based on evidence, I would say my theory is leaning more towards the disappearance side, where she wanted to go. There was evidence about her boyfriend at the time, Bill, that was abusive, but that didn't come out till several years later. I couldn't really say it was anything more than she just wanted to live a new life. I'm not really sure where I fall in this whole case I always get stuck in some kind of rabbit hole so all I'm gonna do to avoid being like a dog chasing its tail is say thank you for listening to another episode of Lies and Alibi. If you want to keep up with the case and see the photos of the people we spoke about follow us on social media. You can follow us on TikTok at Lies and Alibi on Instagram at Lies and Alibis Podcast and on Twitter, Lies Alibis P.O.D.